White balance and the basic adjustment sliders are probably the most versatile and commonly used tools in your photography toolbox. And we're gonna cover both of them today. We're gonna make sure that you know all of the tips and tricks to make sure that you get the absolute most out of each of these tools. This is episode three of the Photomator Masterclass, so welcome back. A couple housekeeping items. Go ahead and grab the photo and the link down below if you'd like to follow along with today's edit. Also, for today's class, we're gonna assume you've watched the previous episodes, and so if you get lost at any point, make sure you just go back and watch those first and then ask a question down in the comments below. I'll make sure to help. And finally, for this video, I've already given a pretty comprehensive explanation of the technical ways that these tools work to help you understand what's going to happen and choose the right tool for the right moment. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this video by playing that section and interjecting the parts that are different for Photomator. And then at the end, we're going to jump into editing the photo that I just shared with you down below. So with Pixelmator open, I'm going to browse files on my Mac and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start with this gradient texture. Now this gradient texture is important because if I come over here to the adjustments tab, I can actually see in my histogram a distribution of these colors. And this is gonna be important to understand what these tools actually do. So make sure you're following along here. If you don't see these histograms, in your Pixelmator window, all you do is you scroll all the way down to the bottom of your color adjustments. I know it's early, but I've already got something I need to interject. So histograms are actually in a different place in Photomator. So first things first, once you have your photo pulled up, if you're not seeing histograms, start by opening the edit menu. And if that works, then you're good. If not, you can come over here to the view menu and go down to histogram. And from here you can pick RGB or luminance, you can also pick how often it shows. So you can always hide it, always show it, or automatically hide and show. So always show means that even when I have the edit tools closed, the histogram's still open. The other thing that you'll notice is that in my options for histograms, I don't have all of the same histogram options. So later in the video when you see that, I'm gonna let it roll, but just understand you're not gonna be able to find that tool in Photomator. I just think showing you what you can do with that other histogram explains white balance in a really useful way. Now, last but not least, you have two options out here actually on your editing canvas. So the first is as you hover to different parts of your image, it will actually show you these RGB values for these different areas. So I can see that up here in this corner, there's no blue value at all. And over here, you know, it's lots and lots of red, which makes sense. The other is if you don't like a particular placement of the histogram, you can drag it to whatever corner you want it to be in. That said, let's get back to the video. And in the histogram, you will have some options. I like to pin my histogram to the top so it's always visible as I'm making edits. And then you will notice I have three options. This is a black and white gradient, so the color option doesn't do much for us. But you'll notice that if I shift between RGB and luminance, it actually looks different. Uh, you can see that now the spacing of these pillars has moved. And that takes us to the first principle that I wanted to explain to you. The way that human eyes perceive light is not consistent or linear for all light. For example, when it comes to color sensitivity, our eyes don't perceive red, green, and blue the same way, with the same level of sensitivity. And sort of the same way, the amount of light or how bright something appears to us isn't linear or even either. In fact, for something to increase in brightness, in a linearly perceived fashion, it actually has to grow exponentially. Now, you don't need to worry about like the difference between linear and exponential right now, but what you can see is the spacing of this is actually representative of how we perceive the light. Okay, that was a lot. All that's to say is for this exercise, we're gonna leave it to RGB, because this makes the histogram actually represent the numbers behind these pixel values, which is useful for this exercise. So now with my histogram in place, I can come back over here and I can show you what some of these editing tools actually do. We're gonna skip white balance uh, for this section and I'm gonna show you first exposure and I'm gonna take you all the way down to black point and we're gonna save texture and clarity for the next section. So exposure. So if I grab this exposure line and just drag it up, 
you will see that the spacing doesn't remain consistent. You can see this brighter line got very, very close to white, and this darker line got very, very far from black. And you will see that the black line actually moved up as well. So two things happening there. The spacing is not consistent, and the black actually moved up. You can see the same thing happens in the opposite direction. The white actually gets pulled down, and the spacing follows this sort of exponential pattern. That's because exposure is trying to adjust for the exposure or the amount of light hitting your camera. Now this is different from the brightness control. You'll notice if I pull the brightness, the black and the white basically stay completely fixed and the three lines in the middle move equally with each other. So if we had more lines, you would see that lines on the far left and the far right would start getting squished. But in general, the lines are going to more or less move exactly the same as each other. That means that brightness behaves much more linearly than exposure does. Now, if you can't picture a use case where you would use one or the other right away, that's okay, we'll get to it. It's just important to know that these both do the same thing. One is just more linear and one is more exponential i.e. one is closer to what your eye perceives, and one is just an adjustment to the pixel values. Now, shadows and highlights are probably the most intuitive ones. You can see that if I grab the highlights, it moves the highlight bar, the bar in the upper quadrant, really far, and it moves the middle bar a little bit. And if you pay really close attention, there's a slight change in the movement of that third quadrant bar in the shadows. And that's because it just has a nice smooth roll off from the highlights. You will also notice that if I pull it the other direction, it brings down the whites with it. Now we can do the same thing with shadows. You'll see if I pull up the shadows, the blacks move with it. And you can see there's sort of a fall off where it's pulling down uh, the darks quicker, which is faster than that medium brightness line. Next in our lineup is contrast, which seems to be every beginner photographer's favorite control. And that's for good reason. When we're looking for things that are pleasing in a photo, we want things that are clear, that are easy for our eyes to distinguish the borders and get separation from the different subjects in the photo. So contrast is one of the tools that we have at our disposal. Unfortunately, Contrast is rarely the tool that you just want to drag all the way up because it usually ends up looking really artificial and it gets contrast in a way that isn't really natural. And I can explain why. So if I grab the contrast slider and I pull it up, you'll notice that the medium dark and the medium light lines move away from the center. And if I pull it the opposite direction to reduce contrast, the medium dark and the medium light lines move towards the center. And that's because contrast is the distance between the bright and the darks that are next to each other. And so this slider takes everything and squishes it out of the middle values and pulls it to the sides, which for some medium exposed photos can be a really good thing. It's not always what we want. And interestingly enough, the slider right underneath it is a lot of times what photos are missing, especially in really bright scenes, to bring back contrast. You can think of what it does as taking the pixel value that is black and making it so it's lighter and lighter, which basically sucks in more colors to become black. And so you'll notice that as I slide it up, it is pulling these colors into the black zone, and it kind of has a smooth roll off to it. Sort of in the same way, if I push it the other direction, it eliminates the black values and pulls everything up. Most of the time, we're going to be increasing the black point though. So when you think of this tool, you can think of this as the way to introduce those dark values if they're missing from your photo. Now, texture and clarity, I can't really show you with this photo. So we're going to open the cloud texture project file that I've included below. Now you will notice with this cloud texture, in the histogram, there's a nice even distribution to it, but you still actually have a decent sense of contrast. 
Yet another illustration of why the contrast slider isn't always what you want. Sometimes you want your values to be in the middle of your histogram. So if we look at the texture and clarity sliders, what these are going to do is they are going to introduce localized contrast. The texture slider does it on a small scale and the clarity slider does it on a larger scale. And you can see this in action with this image. So if I take clarity and I crank this up, you can see how I start developing these large black spots in my image. Now, you must admit that is more contrast, but we're losing detail in sacrifice for that contrast. If I take the texture instead and really crank that up, you can see that it is introducing more contrast in between individual little parts. And this really brings out the texture in leaves or in clothing or in other things. So for a lot of our photos, we're going to be favoring texture over clarity, but there are lots of use cases where clarity needs to be added, at least sparingly, to the entire photo. So with all of those tools at your disposal, let's jump into the actual photo and talk about white balance and then show you how to use each of these tools. All right, now that you have the photo downloaded for the edit, let's jump into it. All right, so the first thing you're gonna do on most photos is you're going to white balance them. You want them to at least be balanced correctly before you jump in and start making crazy edits. So you can start here by just clicking ML and that will let machine learning try to figure out what white balance you should be using. Now in this case, the machine learning seems to think that a negative two and a negative 15 is appropriate. That's okay if I toggle this on and off. I mean, that really makes the greens stand out. But even if that was correct, I don't think that that's what I actually want for this image. The other thing you can do is you can start looking for something that's close to a neutral gray and using that as a calibration point. So if I hover over here, you can see uh, up in my histogram, this is very close to neutral gray already, sort of right here. This area is very close to neutral gray already, but it's slightly on the blue side. Over here, it's slightly less on the blue side, so slightly on the warm side. Uh, to me, that says that this is already probably well calibrated, but if there was something that you knew was your gray point, so let's say maybe over here these shadows were really blue and you knew that this was gray concrete or something in the background, you can use the eyedropper to just pick it and it'll automatically calibrate it so that in your histogram it shows the red, green, and blues are perfectly balanced. To me, this is fine. This is about what I would do. The one thing that I would note is most modern cameras really don't have that much problem with tint. And so anytime I'm introducing more than four or 5% in tint, it feels like an artistic choice. I, I don't know that this photo needs that much of it at all, honestly. And the other thing, which I already mentioned, is that white balance can be an artistic choice. So in this particular photo, I might go ahead and cool it off even farther just to get it to the point that these greens are really separated from these oranges. Having a little bit of a cool temperature helps with the greens. Throwing in a little purple helps maintain the contrast. But from there, you've got three solid options for trying to figure out a good white balance for your photos. But remember, perfect isn't the goal. Something that looks visually pleasing to you is the goal. So next, let's go through our basic adjustments. Before we tackle exposure highlights and shadows, let's start by switching our histogram over to luminance so you can see where our values are being stacked. So for this case, we're a little bit below the middle line. And so if I pull this up quite a bit, I can get it right in the middle. And I'll be honest with you, if this was shot in very bright daylight and this was a paler colored flower, I, this actually might be okay. Like these actually look like really sunlit leaves to me. The problem is, is I know what this photo was and I like the mood to it. This is very overcast shaded area. And so we were not in direct sunlight. And so even though you can use the exposure to compensate for something like this being completely shifted, maybe thinking your exposure settings on your camera were wrong, I actually think this darker color is more accurate to how it looked. And plus, I like the vibe. And so as you're thinking about exposure, 
In this case, you might be like me and think, you know what? I actually like that dark vibe quite a bit. I think there's something nice about this vibrant flower against this dark setting. So that's what I'm going to roll with. The next are the highlights. So I like to crank tools at the very beginning just to see what they're going to affect. And you can see that as I crank highlights, there's a couple areas of this flower that are really getting the most impact here. I'm going to say, for me, cranking down the highlights is maybe closer to what I want. I'm going to turn it down for now, and then I'm going to revisit it if I don't like the look after I've played with the shadows and the brightness, because all of these sort of play off of each other. Now for the shadows, I can crank this down, and you can see most of this is in the shadows, which is not surprising. Most of the histogram is on the left side, so almost the entire photo is going to be affected by it. I actually am going to leave the shadows exactly where they are. And I think I'm probably going to do the same thing with brightness, honestly, because if I turn down or up the brightness, it shifts the mood. And maybe here after seeing it, I'm going to eat my own words. So like, again, if I went over here, that's way too bright for what I know this photo was. But if I just do like a little bit of brightness, just enough that the flower is starting to stand out a little bit more, that could actually be okay. Next is contrast. Like I explained in the introduction, contrast just smushes things right out of the center of your brightness curves there. So if I grab this and crank it, you can see it does make it contrasty, but not in a way that's visually appealing. So I'm actually gonna skip contrast and come back to it later. I feel like this is a little bit like salt where I like to add it at the end if it feels like it needs it. For black point, this is one where I, I can tell from the histogram there are very few actual black pixels. And so I'm just gonna pull on this black point. Like I could go really crazy, right? And get, get it really black. But I don't wanna go so far that the interior of the flower starts turning black. So I can go up to here, that's too far. So let's dial it back, dial it back, dial it back. Something right there starts to feel nice. And you can see I've just got this little bit of margin right here on my histogram where I've introduced some pure blacks. Now finally, my two favorite sliders, texture and clarity. I like to start with clarity just to see what broad strokes would do. And you can see that there's probably somebody that is down for, for that edit right there. I'm, I'm not. In fact, like as you play with this, I honestly even think, like I'm looking at this leaf right here, just the slightest hint. Because if I go the other way, you know, it looks kind of cool actually, <laughs> like kind of airbrushy, but I like the feeling and the texture. And so I just, just a little bit more than what I got, especially since I don't know that I had the focus totally perfect on this. Like anything I can do to add a little bit more here, I, I like. And then finally, texture. And texture is one that, I mean, if you go crazy with it, it's the same as clarity. So what I'm looking at are these details right here in the flower and even like right here in the stem thing. I don't know what that's called. And I'm just gonna turn that up. And you can see, I'm, I want to get some of this detail back and, and get a little interest so that there's something to look at. It's not just a smudgy mess in the flower. But I don't want to, you can see, explode the background and ruin all of our other adjustments by adding way too much texture. So again, maybe something just right in, in the same ballpark, maybe slightly higher than clarity. All right, now we can come up to the top here and we can do before and after. Before, I still think looked like a great photo, but after definitely has a little bit more of a mood to it. All right, that's it for episode three. If you like this and you want to make sure you get all the next episodes early, make sure you support me here on YouTube or over on Patreon, where I give you early access to all of my videos. If you have any questions about topics that I didn't quite cover in this video, make sure to leave them in the comments below, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.